I think wars, by hypothesis, are irrational, which is to say that no side in this debate can go in and say that, look, there's a rational way to conduct war, which is to say, even if you have proportionate response, we think that's not the most rational response. The most rational response probably would be like diplomatic pressure, getting the like absolute perpetrators into jail. The fact that opposition is okay with proportionate response shows that they're okay with viciousness to some extent and proportionate extent. We think the more justifiable and utile outcome of war is through a disproportionate response in most cases. That's the first clarification. Second clarification, we don't think government is going to disproportionately like, extend this war for a couple of reasons. Wars will continue on either side. For Firstly, the fact that a civilian attack has happened shows that this war is severe enough to go beyond state mercenaries and state combatants and to civilians, which shows that this war is already quite intense. Second, the fact that we attack them proportionately in response means that they will obviously re-attack proportionately again, which goes on to show that even in the opposition's war, the wars will continue. But thirdly, the only way to probably stop war is literally not responding at all, accepting what is happening in the status quo and coming to like some kind of consensus through a peace uh, deal. I don't think that happens in most cases, and that's not the burden that all has. So they can't push on the way we extend wars from our case either. Okay. With those clarifications said, what does disproportionate attack mean? We are literally okay with even attacking their civilians if they attack ours. We are okay with destroying the economic structures, the ways in which the economy and the political states function. If they kill one of our civilians, we're okay with killing three of theirs, and we'll justify that in our case. A couple of substantiatives in principle, and then the Utah outcome of how we win wars better. First, let's understand what a state is and the roles of a state. Recognize that a state is a fucking coercive entity, which is to say that a state has huge amounts of power over you that you as an individual civilian have given the state. Ultimately meaning the only moral reciprocity that a state has is to protect you and your identity. We think at that point in time, this identity and the biggest core of that identity is your social security. The point in time when that social security is at threat, the state ultimately has failed you and it deserves to compensate you for that loss in any proportionate means. At that point in time, it is the state's moral duty, assuming that there are different states in this world, to do as many things as possible to redress the kinds of emotional trauma that you have when you and your social security is at threat. Second. But secondly, understand what this enemy is like. The characterization of this enemy is not a utile enemy who's looking for like certain things through war. This is not a war of anti-oppression. This is not a war of like some kind of utile economic gains by get getting land. The fact that there's an intention to attack an innocent civilian who literally can serve no purpose to the greater role of states at large shows that this entity that is attacking is a purely evil entity out there to fear monger, out there to create Fear within states create hostility within people. There is no utile outcome to killing people. There is only irrational fear. We think such entities also deserve to be completely wiped out from the world. There is no irrational reason why these kinds of entities who don't kill to have utile outcomes but kill purely because they like it are any different to terrorists because terrorists do literally the same thing. Kill people to have fear in society, have like literal ways in which their voices can be heard. We think these enemies deserve to be completely wiped out in their totality. That's the first reason. Second characterization. We think this debate is one where the entity that retracts and re like gives an action disproportionately is only doing it in self-defense. We think there are three layers of analysis under this. First, the number of civilians that have already died is due to moral luck. What does this mean? The fact that 10 civilians have died is just purely due to the 10 civilians being there at that point in time, being present in the firing line. If there were 5,000 civilians there, the entity would have killed 5,000 of them and they have an intention to wipe out all civilians within the state. It's moral luck that the number of lives that have been lost are the number. So we don't think that these people have just, like, proportionate responses unfair because the proportional response is due to the intention which is to kill as many civilians as possible at that point in time. Second, this self-defense is also against the people of the opposing entity as well. Yeah, sure. 
it might be in the first instance of death, morally random, whether or not you kill 10 people or 50 people. But clearly, in the second retaliatory stage, you're choosing to kill 100 or 200, and that part isn't random. Yeah, so if you're okay with proportionality, we think that we are being proportional because the intention is to harm more people than that have that been harmed. So we're just being proportional by being disproportional, if that makes sense. We think the proportionality doesn't have to be based on action, but rather based on intention. That's the analysis we give you. We think they need to respond to that. Second, we think this self-defense also exists against the people, and this is where we justify killing counter-civilians as well. We think no entity in this world can get away with killing civilians without political will, which is to say how are wars waged? You don't just get money for war out of randomness, you get it through referendums. Political will, huge amounts of support for wars, which is how the IDF gains huge amounts of traction to carry out its like, attacks on the Gaza Strip, or how Palestinians tech, like, historically have supported Hamas. We don't think the power of Hamas exists in absence of the power of like the support they get from the Palestinian people on the ground. Ultimately meaning, if the attack happens through Hamas as a political entity, it is not just Hamas that is doing the attack, but with the support of the people in the Gaza Strip that systematically empower Hamas and its actions. Therefore, if we retaliate against the people, we are not doing it against people that are completely scotch-free. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. right. Uh, do you therefore support the escalation of warfare that is happening within the Gaza Strip against Israel? We just told you in my first minute that escalation of war won't happen. It's a mutual trade-off that both sides have to agree with. That was literally the first thing I talked about to show why escalation of war doesn't happen. But we think that self-defense is against people as well. Which is to say, if these people, these civilians, are empowering this entity that is carrying out these attacks, we deserve the ability to defend ourselves against the very people that are causing the attacks and are the root cause of the attacks as well. We don't think those people are innocent, the ones we attack. Lastly, how do you win wars better? First, I think you win wars by reacting forcefully instead of going like dead into the night. We show that we have strength and we prevent future attacks by massively deterring proportional responses. Why is this the case? Because they'll think twice before attacking 10 civilians because we literally attack 50 of theirs. They're afraid of the kinds of harms that will retract to them. That ends wars better. Second, we have continuous political will for these wars, which is saying we avenge people that have died, which is why they're more likely to support our cause in wars. They're more likely to redirect funding for economic decisions to military ones that allow states to win wars better because there's a continuous political will, continuous funding. We end wars swiftly and justifiably. Very glad to close. Thank you. I thank that speaker for those remarks. This House now recognizes the Leader of the Opposition. Here. Every now and then I worry that neoconservatives is dead in America. But um, luckily, after that speech, we can safely say it's well and alive. Um, two areas to discuss um, in this debate. Firstly, why um, this policy systemically fails to actually deter um, any kind of, sort of military action in any meaningful sense. Secondly, why, in fact, it vastly increases the magnitude of violence, and integrate my fire bottle within those discussions. Um, before that, though, a little bit of discussion in terms of the stance and exactly where this debate kind of is. Um, note that most cases are not, in fact, the cases they're talking about of literal, direct, traditional, state on state warfare of the kind of form of the 19th century or whatever, which largely um, is a much less of a thing in the world now that used to be. Rather, we think the most relevant context is usually non-state actors. These are insurgent groups, even the very examples they use of groups like Hamas fully fall into this very category, where one of the logics of deterrence that they talk about and work less effectively, but I just want to flag that um, to start off with. Um, also, it's worth noting that their logic about kind of um, all this stuff about kind of killing civilians never being rational in wartime also largely doesn't make sense. Kind of, you know, even, the, even the United States and Britain uh, bombed a huge number of civilians over the course of the Second World War, not least in dress, and what's probably a pretty good example of their case, there clearly are kind of you know, non-sadistic evil logics behind this, which suggests that a lot of this stuff about kind of escalation no longer really works. Probably the principle going to sound behind this debate is that fewer dead people is a good thing. Hopefully it shouldn't be too controversial a principle. First thing to talk about then why this policy simply fails to cause any meaningful deterrence. So the first thing to note under this is just the vast majority of cases we've talked about are non-state actors which simply operate under a different logic to state actors. In general, they're deeply, deeply ideologically motivated. You know, so a group like Al-Qaeda, for instance, is a pretty good example of this, where they have very, very clear intentions, therefore aren't likely to respond to deterrence the same way. Secondly, sure. no, thank you. Sure. They're often just very, very difficult to find and like identify and kind of you know, call, like, have military action against, which will lead on to like, my latest material about, about kind of civilian casualties and side events, which generally means it kind of actually kind of doing kind of deterrence against that is very effective, but most importantly because they have different kind of ideologies and values and won't respond to cost and benefits the same way that a state does. Even in terms of a state though, 
Note that the picture's a lot more muddy and complicated than they want to suggest, um, for a number of reasons. Um, to start off with, uh, lots of states actually actively value the international sympathy and political attention and strength that they often gain from a disproportionate response. We should say that a disproportionate response turns from a perpetrator into a victim in the eyes of a lot of the international community, and certainly in the eyes of, kind of your domestic community and where it's being played up. And actually often can be seen as a benefit by groups rather than necessarily a downside. Even beyond that, though, we tell you that the reasons why, why kind of, you know, countries engage in like military or non-military kind of provocative actions against other countries often aren't arith sort of arithmetic in the sense that they want to claim. So, yeah, for instance, in the UK right now, the, sc the, the scandal over killing Sergei Skripal is not the issue, well, almost killing him. It's not, it's not really an issue about the fact that two people died. That's, it's much more an issue kind of sovereignty and the fact that the US, UK so, is like, you know, kind of space international community wasn't respected and so on, which explains why the response was um, to kind of put on sanctions, expel diplomats, rather than just killing 12 civilians, which is to say that often the reasons people do something won't exactly track to what the numerical costs and benefits necessarily are. The final thing, so on the terms, so, is that for deterrence to be functional, you need a credible threat. For that to be true, you need lots and lots and lots of test cases in which you've done the thing, which means at the very least to establish any kind of credibility, any given actor needs to do this thing a lot of times to establish deterrence in a meaningful sense. The second thing to do here, though, is you need to establish deterrence in a meaningful sense relative to every actor. So Obama claiming like he has a particular policy on Iran, but then having a particular red line on Syria that he then doesn't draw, means he has to establish credibility both with Iran and Syria, which means he then needs to do all those actions with both of those groups. Um, oh, finally, sir. the specific justification, no thank you, that we get, uh, we only get one of them um, that's not literally a line out of their side of why deterrence actually happens, is that this stops the willful war. And I think actually a much more convincing narrative is this can often galvanize groups, particularly during wartime, when there's very, very disproportionate response. Literally, the, the very tactic um, of the FLN in colonial Algeria was to cause disproportionate responses in order to get the Algerian population riled up and more ready to get out France. We find that fairly hard to believe, but yes. Just to put this in context, if one Al-Qaeda tribe attacks five of your civilians, your response is only killing five Al-Qaeda soldiers and letting the other go free. Uh, our response is proportionality. We imagine it's not like arithmetic proportionality. You can maybe do something to stop killing civilians. You can like bomb their headquarters or something. Um, I mean, yeah, that's exactly what we broadly think is like reasonable. I mean, obviously Al Qaeda is a big threat, which they probably are, but it's proportional to a lot more. Um, cool. Secondly, though. Um, escalating violence. Just five reasons why violence gets a shit ton worse on their side of the house they have to deal with. First, necessarily, it's almost always going to involve civilian casualties, which generally is just a bad thing in and of itself, and kind of, you know, whereas that conflict makes them worse. Necessarily, often, if we're doing civilian targets, this has to be, um, kind of, you know, necessarily tip tap, no thanks. But also, again, any smart enemy is likely to understand the value of civilian casualties, and uh, as many terrorist groups do, put their headquarters and put sensitive things near civilians in such a way that damage can necessarily happen. Moreover, just the history of war is one where people try to avoid civilian casualties casualties generally do a pretty bad job of doing it. Second thing to do here is, in contrast to what they say, this is necess necessarily escalatory, which is to say that at any given stage, if someone, someone attacks you, you respond in a disproportionate manner, even a proportionate response by them escalates the tenor and intensity of the conflict, and often states will respond rather with disproportionate response. This can happen again and again and again. For instance, you know, in the late 80s, the US shot down a passenger jet um, of, fr from Iran. If Iran had literally responded by shooting down 15 US passenger jets, we can very, very quickly see a way in which a small diplomatic for a car turns into a literal war by virtue of the way we change incentives operating more generally. I'll take closing before I go on. So in 2015, ISIS was reliant on two dozen contiguous oil fields and less than 100 admittedly large armories. Would your side take them all out? I, I mean, like, presumably this is also referring to, like, what kind of threat they pose and things like that. So, I mean, also, like, if, if, if ISIS is in a given territory and is attacking a government, presumably that constitutes them posing a pretty big threat, you can then have a disproportionate response to it. Uh, cool. Thirdly, in general, I think negotiations between groups likely break down. I mean, things like the FARC negotiations show how decades-long conflicts can actually often be stopped by sensible diplomacy. The way that works, though, is a feeling of reasonableness and good faith operating on both sides. That breaks down colossally at the point at which a side is being seen to be acting disproportionately, vindictively, and killing people unnecessarily beyond what is kind of seen as broadly proportional and justifiable on the inside of the house. The fourth reason why this is true is just that the way that soldiers in a particular military are indoctrinated to see the enemy changes when you see something disproportionate, which is to say that the way you look at warfare moves from being a thing where you do what is necessary and you do the minimum necessary thing to kind of stop future actions from happening, um, into a situation where the upper bound on hostile action against the enemy is essentially unlimited. But this often means that we generally get kind of people joining the military with a far greater capacity for violence. There's far more of a dehumanization of the enemy happening and things like military training to make this necessary. And this in general just increases the propensity for issues like war crimes and things which can be very bad. The fifth and final thing to note here is context of rebuilding. So actually, often the most important context happen after the war. In the case of the Iraq invasion, for instance, um, the use of disproportionate military power in order to achieve a particular goal means that people in a particular society don't generally have as positive a view of the people 
people who are rebuilding their territory occupied them, with the people they are formerly fighting, are in a situation where they saw that you know they did some things, they did what's necessary, they didn't unnecessarily kill civilians beyond what was seen as reasonable. That makes it far, far more difficult to then like build further cooperation more generally. It's cashed out in a number of ways. It's cashed out in terms of future conflicts, or potentially just rebuilding the situation, leading to a huge amount of instability, sectarianism, and danger. Look, ultimately, the world they create is a much more dangerous one, a much more scary one, and one that causes far, far more wars. For that reason alone, we're very happy to oppose. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker, very much for those remarks. This House now recognizes the Deputy Prime Minister. Here, here. entities are at war against each other, irrespective of whether they are state actors or non-state actors, the, you basically black mark the entirety of the opposition entity, and you have a conscious like determination to take all of them down anyway. Yeah. To simplify this, if you are on a war against Al-Qaeda, irrespective, like the status quo, if that's what the opposition is defending, is one in which you will take down the entirety of Al-Qaeda anyway. The debate then is now about whether or not, if you are in a position to push this harm down to other civilians who are either proven or unproven associates of Al-Qaeda, or live in the periphery of that land, or if you were to chunk the entirety of civilians of one particular state actor who you think are collateral, who, who you can incur or inflict damage upon, would you do that? And the answer from opening the government is yes. The reason why is that, so the first idea coming from opening opposition is that we'll only take down portions of the opposition entity. I don't think you'll do that anyway. So for instance, when Al-Qaeda takes down, like when there is al proven Al-Qaeda, uh, like, uh, evidence that they took down like the, like the like the World Trade Center, you took a conscious like decision to take down the entirety of the organization. You didn't only take a decision to take down only two or three of the individuals who are the masterminds behind this organization. The question now is when you bombard the military, like bombard their air bases, when you bombard uh, like, uh, like individuals who are part of that organization, do you do it in a restricted way that only selectively attacks those individuals or would you would you go out in an all-out rampage that wipes out the entirety of their oh, no. organization? I think in most cases, and in all of the cases that the open government pro proposes, we'll go for the latter. Firstly, because it creates a far more effective way of taking out the entirety of the enemy. Thank the, you. If the ultimate goal of this debate is to win a war, which, we, which Sajid has proven, that there is no principle when you are justifying decisions based on a war, you're consciously making a decision to take another individual's life, even if that individual, whether or not that individual was part of the attack, I think you also take a coordinated attempt to make sure that you take the best actions possible to take down the uh, opposing organization. I think you are in a position to best invoke that kind of fear and best invoke a situation when the opposition loses the bravery or the courage to attack right. you back when you strike a disproportionate response to those individuals. I think that's incredibly important. But if you think that states usually sympathize from not attacking in an all out manner that they would have otherwise done. Ultimately, if you're relying on other countries to rally behind you, to support you, and then prove like death, and then like lay some sort of coordinated attempt to attack the anyway, uh, attack the attack the enemy, then ultimately this is a disproportionate response anyway. So for instance, if you're relying on the entirety of the NATO and the entirety of like your Western allies to back up USA in the war against Iraq, then ultimately you are principally conceding sure. to a disproportionate response against the individuals who attacked you in the first place. And we think that is legitimate by the principle that you support on our side. But recognize this. Your primary responsibility is to your civilians. And when you are a sworn citizen of a country, you place your civilians and your citizens 
on a greater pedestal compared to the civilians of any other nation. Which means that your primary responsibility is firstly to your citizens to best enable them to like seek avenge and seek closure from an attack that they that they that they received in the very first place. In that point of time, I think you make a coordinated attempt to make sure that these individuals are protected better. If ultimately I win a war by making sure that the enemy is objectively torn down. And second, psychologically torn down as a means of the response that I'm giving back to the enemy, then it makes best sense to go out on a disproportionate attack. One, because I repeat again, you're more motivated primarily by the incentive to win the war and not be humane in this regard. Because if you were to be humane in this regard, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have struck proportionately in the first place. You would have probably got into the other territory and selectively taken the perpetrators and put them in jail or incarcerated them in some fashion. Because you're avoiding that altogether, you made a moral decision to take a life. And the way that you can best reap the benefits of taking these lives is to make sure that this war is permanently put to a stop. Yes. Sure, so this debate isn't just about winning one individual abstract war. Uh, doesn't this make it much more difficult for negotiations to happen, make future wars more likely if the US, for instance, sees the kind of actor that disproportionately kills thousands of civilians? Right. If you want to make negotiations possible, firstly, you would want to work with an entity that wants to negotiate with you in the first place. Often, when they are attacking civilians, most likely these individuals aren't in a position to negotiate with you in the first place, which is an objective reason why to take them out altogether. But even if you were to negotiate and coerce them to sign a peace deal, you would be much better off when you have the upper hand in the negotiating table. So for instance, if you are engaging with an entity like ISIS or like a rogue faction of Taliban or say North Korea, hypothetically speaking, if they like, like start a war in the upcoming years, then you would be best able to put those countries sign like make those countries or entities sign a peace deal or cooperate with the kind of demands that you have when you're in a position to coerce them when you have a disproportionate response that de debilitated the enemy we think that's incredibly important but recognize this the point at which those individuals yeah. made a conscious decision to attack you uh, like yeah before that right so the principal argument that you are protecting the civilians within your own state only works at the point in which you can guarantee that your state is able to win that war with this promotional response what about smaller states that can't afford to keep out of this arms race yeah so if i am motivated by the intent to win that for war for my country then i'm primarily motivated by the intent to wipe out that enemy altogether which is the reason why linking back to my earlier analysis all of that makes sense but understand this when the opposing faction made a conscious decision to attack you i would re-emphasize sergeant's words on a plan which has not been responded to in this particular debate that some civilians only died because of the fact that some civilians were present when the enemy made a conscious decision to attack your civilians then probably if more citizen, civilians were present in that particular place, they have already made the moral decision to wipe out as many people as possible from your race. So at that point of time, it also makes a commensurate moral decision to take out as much of the opposing warring faction uh, like in, in that particular point of war. Not only because this is principally commensurate, but also because you are motivated by the objective, like, objective goal of taking down your enemy. At the end of the day, if war is where we have taken a conscious decision to take a human life, we would best reap the benefit of that resulting decision if we are to debilitate an enemy. Ultimately, even if it is to make sure that the enemy cooperates with you at the end of the day, you have a better hand in, uh, in negotiations when you like take out that all the Thank you. We thank that speaker for those remarks. This House now recognizes the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Here, here. The logic of side government is genuinely frightening. They say if somebody has attacked us and they've killed, say, some of our civilians, 
the obvious response is to entirely annihilate them and to scare them into never attacking us again, because obviously that's feasible and a great thing. I'm going to explain very clearly, and I think Archie's already done a great job, of why one, more times, like this is not feasible. It is very difficult to actively exterminate everybody living in a particular country or from a particular group that we want to talk about. And even in the cases where you can absolutely exterminate every single one of them, we still think that is a bad outcome and that's not a world that we want to live in. So given that, I'm going to talk about some of our material and refute them and then summarize them that way. What do we give you? Archie talks to you about why non-state actors matter in this case and why oftentimes it's not just massive state-to-state -state warfare, though we engage in that as well. The response we get to this coming from closing as well as opening is they talk about ISIS and they say, well look, ISIS has oil fields uh, and what do we do? This question is one of where a certain group hasn't, say, directly attacked the U.S., but they might have broader intentions to do so in the future. They have larger resources. What we would say to this is that, first of all, with ISIS, if they've taken over Mosul, let's say, and they took over a piece of land that is particularly important in a central area, then we can take that back. If they attack Washington in terms of trying to eliminate the leaders from a particular country, then we can try and eliminate their leaders. The, what we wouldn't do is try and eliminate their leaders and the civilians around the area in which they live. So that is fairly consistent. The first thing we speak about then is why this massively just fails to deter people. Archie gives you multiple reasons that aren't responded to, right? He talks to you about ideological motivations, he talks about international support, and he talks about why it's not necessarily an arithmetic claim, but rather trying to send a message and leverage that in negotiations. The response we get to this is, well, no, 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 the opposition is now afraid, so they're not going to act. There are two problems with this. First, this ignores the, all of the cases presently in the world that exists, or in which they have already acted, right? We can't do anything like that. So all you have there is the disproportionate response, which we think is unfair. But the second thing to note here is in terms of future radicalization, I think you made that far worse on their side of the house, and this is a very short-term view that they're taking. First of all, we simply think that if you take a disproportionate response, even international media and other international actors, which previously could have helped uh, you know, mitigate and sort of mediate through these negotiations, now are no longer able to do that. So for instance, China can no longer be speaking with North Korea when it comes to a disproportionate US response against North Korea, because clearly they say, look, there's no more moral high ground here, we can't buy that. Secondly, you have all the radicalization harms of damaged infrastructure in the area afterwards, right? So let's say you're able to take a targeted attack, no thank you, that takes out the leaders of ISIS, let's say. If you destroy all the economic infrastructure in these schools and the roads in the area, that means that people have a hard time finding jobs, getting an education, and later on you make it harder to rebuild and actually solve that problem. So clearly, this fails to deter and actually makes it worse. And the second thing we gave you was five reasons why this escalates violence. I think they only responded to like two of them. There's a really important one here that they responded to. Archie says that this disproportionately builds up on itself in an escalating sort of exponential way, right? You kill two, we kill four, and so on and so forth. The response we get to this is preempted in OG, and they say, well, your steady state is still bad because if it's proportionate, you know, you kill two, we kill two, and this keeps on going back and forth. This is, in, this is incorrect in terms of viewing why our outcome is the same as theirs. Our outcome is far less likely to tend towards everybody dying because the steady state in which both actors are consistently, no thank you, grinding each other down is one where political will for negotiations becomes larger and larger because people have to live in a warring state for a prolonged period of time where they say, hey, this actually isn't something that I want to do. Under their side of the house, you jump to the most extreme option immediately, which is what they want, to, amass, to, to like immediately carpet bomb everybody, so you think you get worse negotiations, or oftentimes with these smaller groups, that's what you want. Harry. Which non-state actors are so weak that the US military would want preemptively to strike them, yet mysteriously so strong that when they are struck, they'd be capable of sending a nuclear warhead back in the direction of the White House? So the problem here is that the way, and Archie mentions this, is the way in which they integrate themselves with civilian populations that we don't actually want to harm. Right, so that is you place your headquarters in a very busy, busy city. The response we get from these guys is, well, let's just sort of take out the civilians too, right? The reason why we think that's problematic and simply on a point of fairness is that we think there's a moral wrong that you do when you bring in more actors that previously weren't involved. We see no moral justification that these guys can give between people attacking your civilians and the, and the other way around. The only response we get is, well, in terms of self-defense, right, this is the optimal thing because we have a duty to you know, protect our own citizens. I think Archie brings up an important point here, which is that you can't view this debate from the perspective of one country, but from all countries. So when these guys say, you know, it's going to be great, we're going to do carpet bomb all the civilians of the other country, what that means is more deaths for all these countries broadly. If we're thinking about choosing a system, one in which you have proportionality and one in which you don't, these guys have more deaths on their side on net, which is something that we're against. So I don't think that their steady state argument makes sense. Archie talks to you about a couple more things. He talks to you about placing civilian targets and breaking down negotiations. Another thing that he mentions that isn't responded to, no thank you, 
is about the soldier psyche and how you actually change the way in which militaries operate. So presently, when you say we're going to use a proportionate response, I think this is something I'll take in a second that intuitively makes sense to people because it's fair. These guys want to bring up the analogy of self-defense. In self-defense, you can only incapacitate the other person to the extent that they're going to kill you, otherwise you can't use self-defense as that justification. But regarding soldiers, what we think you get then is more dehumanization, and the types of people who are likely to sign up for this are ones who believe, you're right, we should be killing more of their people than we did ours because they are morally inferior to us, this is an act of revenge that we should execute, and all the like fairly reasonable people who like proportionality will cease to become part of that, we think that's a terrible norm to set within your military. Obviously, if it's one leader or one military target that they're taking down, you can proportionally respond and take up military targets on the other side. But if it's civilians, it's a conscious attempt to wipe out yeah, your yeah. faction altogether, which is the reason why it makes sense to go for a disproportionate response that wipes out that entity. I just think that's a bit of an unnuanced view, right? Like oftentimes what these people are trying to do is do something large in terms of like civilians to try and get onto the news, but they'd really rather not kill all of your civilians or you know or get killed all by themselves. What that means then is in your situation where they've already killed three civilians, they might as well say, well screw it, you know, we're gonna be carpet bombed anyways. Let's just do as much damage as we can in the short term because this is the response. We think that leads to the worst outcome. So the final thing I want to speak about then is in responding to some of what they say. The first argument that I want to respond to is their issue of moral luck and sort of justifying on intent. I think this is extremely dangerous. They say it doesn't really matter whether they killed 10 civilians or 5,000 civilians because the intent was sort of to kill civilians in some number, so therefore we can extrapolate from that and make it uh, you know, a, larger, a larger amount. This is extremely dangerous because it becomes a facade under which militaries can act disproportionately and where the channel of regular civilian anger can come to bear out in a terrible way. What do I mean by this? Average civilians, when they see their neighbor, let's say they see two of their neighbors shot and die, it's a terrible experience, they're very angry, they may well want to wipe up the entire population of the other country. We think this is probably a silly response because these people aren't thinking about long-term international relations and what that the world is going to look like for them later on when it escalates. They're thinking in that short-term view. The problem then is you allow this narrative and this mindset to be the one that's coming through when militaries and politicians now no longer have the political ability to say, look, it's an international norm we're following. The ones who are able to galvanize that will to hurt the most number of people are the ones that win. It's not a world we're willing to stand for. Very proud to announce. recognizes the member of government. You're here. I think it is uncharitable of OO to capitalize OG's case cases like every time someone comes to be a carpet bombing their nation. I think it is fair to say we are not using this always, but we use it sometimes when it's strategically necessary. With that in mind, three things in this speech. Firstly, why we're going to use, why we're going to use this when it's strategically necessary. That is a significant deterrent to engaging in sort of action. Secondly, why it is in fact strategically necessary, building on the excellent analysis that's come from OO. And three, how it incentivizes conflict. Because we recognize in the status quo, there are actors incentives to kill civilians. That is, it is the only way that non the actors can often operate in a way that's effective or gains in response. And why the only way you can change that is providing a significant enough deterrent to that specific sort of warfare that you switch away from it altogether. Most responses are overwoven or will come in the end. But like, so let's first talk about why we, um, we will only use it when we need to. Because recognize why this doesn't make all of those arguments go away. It certainly mitigates them, right? You're probably less likely to be hated both by domestic populations and abroad if like the people see your actions as broadly justified or as necessary for the activity you're going to be engaging in, right? Four reasons why people are only going to use it when they need to. Firstly, the diplomacy reason. Like, yeah, oh, it's perfect, correct to point out that it often creates controversy with allies and cause harm and is very risky diplomatically. Secondly, it's risky to generals personally, right? They don't want to get caught in martial of, like, improper activity afterwards. And even if they're not, like, they want the domestic public opinion to switch such that they get kicked out, don't get renominated, don't get promoted in the future, right? Thirdly, it often requires more um, commitment to state voting afterwards, which is something that states are very reluctant to sign in, because they recognize most people do realize it will be a PR disaster not to help someone you've carpet bombed afterwards. They're probably going to have to go in to have bomb or resources if they engage in this sort of activity, which most governments are pretty, probably want to do. And fourthly, even though we don't actually believe there will be much retaliation, you do slightly increase the risk, which is a big deal. And including the ideal population, you probably increase the risk, which is a big deal in terms of politics. All this means that it's actually not going to be used very frequently, right? So what is the sort of, um, and it will probably be used when necessary. It also means that like people are probably more likely to see it as necessary or as useful, which mitigates a lot of their like backlash, radicalization, um, argumentation. But like, let's talk about the situations when it is necessary. Because I think there's one very specific thing that's missing. 
Both my people have different value systems. That is, two civilian lives are not equally weighted in by both of these groups. Some of people think that one civilian life is worth, like, that their ideology is worth thousands of billion lives. Some people think that, like, one civilian life is enough to go to war over, right? This means that if you respond proportionally, it's often not actually deterrent or to at all to the group that you're responding to because they don't see it even at, because they don't see it as sufficient. So they talk about, like, people who are ideologically motivated by conflict, like, who will do anything to fight. If this is the case, the only thing that will deter them or the only thing that will reasonably take their decision calculus is existential threat, right? Because you can't continue to spread your ideology if you no longer exist. However, their ideology, as they point out, is sufficient to justify you doing everything and, like, continuing to fight as long as that threat does not exist, right? This means that, in some cases, direct proportionality just doesn't deter the people and the thinking of the people who are engaging in some sort of actions, and therefore will never um, be useful for warfare. It also won't... Um, Okay, so, um, no, thank you. Um, we also think that like sometimes leaders don't care about their people at all. This will be crippling massive economic sections is necessary. This is if we ever do decide to attack North Korea, we're going to have to go all out because I don't think Johnson cares how many people we kill, he cares about staying in power, right? Secondly, often recognized as a time gap. So, crucially, just because something isn't dangerous now does not mean it will be dangerous in the future. So, let's say if we had bombed ISIS in 2013, they probably wouldn't have taken over Iraq and like and like hurt nearly like, the 100,000 people they have. If you do, if you perceive something to be a growing threat, it is justified to um, act because you're protecting civilians in the future. And then and finally, we think that it, is, it can often be difficult um, to judge both where these people are in terms of like, they can be hidden among civilians. We think if you're hidden among civilians, you're going to cause casualties and difficulties in the future. You're justified in killing civilians now in order to protect those civilians in the future. But also, if all the analysis that OET gave us, insofar as you're justified in protecting your own civilians, if you think they might be a risk, you're justified in acting in that way. So there are some situations where only disproportionate response is going to elicit the necessary reactions from people because their motivations do not respond to proportionality. But now let's talk about shifting towards a different kind of warfare, right? Because what's been missed, what um, OO misses when they're like sometimes these people kill civilians? And Amit actually weirdly enough gets close to it when he's like, they, like killing civilians is the only tool they have to elicit responses because it witnesses a disproportionate response. That's to say, if I'm a terrorist and I kill three American civilians, even though I have no economic power, no political power, this is the only thing I can do, this is actually the most effective form of warfare I can engage in. Because it elicits disproportionate responses, like we say, like, get people to give me concessions, or I believe it's like making concessions, or it's the only tool I can have to get me concessions, right? So you're incentivized to go after civilians because it's the very best tool you have because of that fear that um, it elicits, right? Second bit of framing in this point is these people do have limited retaliation skills. So, as Harry does point out in his POI, a bit 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 flippy, like, it is difficult for ISIS to retaliate effectively against the United States, particularly after a massive, uh, a massive campaign. Um, they just don't have the infrastructure, right? This, it, I mean, this is particularly true when they actually aren't proximate. Um, and thirdly, they act, no, I think I'm just second actually, ma'am. And thirdly, these people actively make this use of disproportionality different. That is, they hire among civilians such that it's difficult to proportionally respond to them. And they make that principle mean that you um, effectively couldn't respond to them. Before I go on. Right, so assuming that um, a disproportionate response ends the war and therefore protects the civilians, assumes that everything remains status quo. However, the killing of more civilians oftentimes is the thing that invigorates things like radicalization or recruitment that ends up prolonging that war in the future. So I'm just going to explain why we think we would use them in, in cases um, in which it does. Secondly, we think that like these groups are often like domestically relatively unpopular. So I don't think ISIS is doing particularly well in the opinion polls in like its local area and so far as it's causing massive problems. Even for like the most generous example, there's probably Al Qaeda in Pakistan, where like they were pretty mad that we weren't in. We have a reason it didn't cause like a long-standing diplomatic crisis because we realized there was some justification for it, and even if they didn't like agree that like the accountability factors were sufficient to like largely stop the accusation. But anyway, back to my other point. So I just explained why um, these uh, this is the only tool that they have. But I, no, thank you. We would read up and down the bench that the killing of civilians is one of the worst action that you can engage with in war, insofar as like, they're innocent, they didn't consent into the conflict. And so we think the only way that you can stop um, the kit that stop this strategic one useful tool being one second being engaged in is if you have a strong enough deterrent, an existential threat to engaging in it, right? Because if it's the only tool you feel like can be effective, it is only the case that if you you will be forced to stop existing, but that tool becomes not something you're going to rely on to go. Yeah, isn't the disproportional response that's actually often exactly what these groups are looking for? In the cases like the FLN in, um, Nigeria, in, oh, sorry, in Algeria, they are actually able to gain a huge amount of international and domestic support as a result of that disproportionate action. Surely, actually, it's better than this group rather than nothing. So firstly, we think that like, if it's, if it's like, obviously true that we're going to turn these countries against it, we cannot engage them. I get we might not wait, wait, permanently. We can avoid the worst excesses of that. But secondly, we just think that like, insofar as like, we can stop the engagement with killing us, like, insofar as like, people don't ultimately want to get wiped out, and if the US is threat large enough, when it's important that that's large enough, it would just destroy the terrorist network, they can't recruit, right? They want a balanced response that's disproportionate enough to like, gain sympathy, but not disproportionate enough so that they're completely wiped out, right? If we're willing to go that extra mile and say it will be an existential threat, and just, government up and down, very willing to defend it, that's when they actually can't engage in that because they're not going to exist to recruit people into the future. So we think that like this forces people to stop killing civilians if they want to continue to exist, right? We also hear this deals with all negotiation stuff. 
And like, our clients, for some reason, told us, like, oh, you, you, you need to, like, set a consistent standard. No. If you're willing to, like, carve up on an area once, people are going to be shit scared of it because you're willing to wipe out the population. I mean, the reason that the US didn't need to drop more than two atomic bombs is because people flipped their shit and realised that it was, a, it was um, pretty dangerous. It's also willing to be in people to negotiating table, dealing with the last thing that OO had standing. We are incredibly proud to propose. Thank that speaker very much for those remarks. I apologize for the intense heat in here. Um, and I, uh, this house is pleased to welcome the member of opposition here. here. Um, just to clarify, are we going to wait for her to come back? Or I, I wasn't planning on it. All right, Mitchell. All right, short clarification. The Spartans debate is focused on what happens uh, in response to attacks by cross-border non-state actors like al Qaeda, Hamas, what to do, right? I think there is a much wider context of wars that we can talk about. There are still many interstate wars that happen within the last 50 years. The Falklands War between Argentina and Britain, uh, wars in the Middle East, like the Iran-Iraq conflict or the Iraq invasion of uh, Kuwait, uh, as well as border wars between China, India, and Pakistan. And the increased context is what, is what will determine like, the veracity of our arguments later on. But there are also factions with interstate wars, for example, like when you have South and North Sudan fighting against each other in, in, in the war that split apart those countries eventually, or when you're talking about the former Yugoslavia splitting up into six constituent countries which eventually fight against each other. So it's not it's it's primarily about actors which control territory, which actually control civilians, and which can claim to some degree to represent those civilians. And this is the sort of thing that we need to analyze, and not just simply like attacking Al Qaeda and destroying all of Al Qaeda's infrastructure, because the debate is far more than just that. Great. Three arguments, therefore. The first one is on the principle, right? And I think this is this runs directly counter to what OG is saying because they assert as one of the key premises that aggressors are always evil. Nonsense, right? There are many cases in which the like the aggress the aggressive aggressor party have, is engaging in legitimate war, and that a disproportionate response will be hugely detrimental to the use of war as a legitimate tool of diplomacy and international relations. So, for example, if Malaysia cuts off Singapore's water supply, we're going to have no choice but to invade Malaysia because otherwise, all, all our civilians are going to die. No, thank you. And a disproportionate response as a result is something that will harm the international interests of smaller states as a result. More importantly, though, if you've got application, no, thank you. More importantly, though, there may be instances in which like both parties to the conflict may be evil actors, right? So if we're talking about the Iran-Iraq war, or if we're talking about civil wars involving the constituent uh, countries of the former Yugoslavian republics, for example, then in many instances, like sure that it's intermittent, like both parties could claim to be the aggressor to the conflict because like, there are many instances of those wars happening over a period of time. And the conduct of both parties in the conflict is probably less than exemplary, which means that any disproportionate response is not just likely to trigger the opposing uh, an even greater disproportionate response in the future, but it's also in principle illegitimate in many instances. And therefore, your ability to uh, engage in self-defense, your ability to protect your sovereignty is not a legitimate justification on the side of the opening government with regard to the use of disproportional force. As a result, we think the emphasis ought to be on protecting civilians and reducing the loss of life to civilians, and if that means imposing an international norm that prevents anything but a proportional response, so be it. In fact, arguably, whether your cause is legitimate or not with regard to being the aggressor state, there is an advantage in having, in principle, a set of norms that prevent anything but a proportional response, because now states will have to think twice about violating these norms, because a violation of such norms will invite, in many cases, international military intervention. So we think that the protection of civilians is ultimately a far more important principle than self-defense or the notion that aggressor states are somehow evil. Second major argument, on the notion of peace for both sides, right? Look, I think one of the key justifications that, uh, that was hinted at in old is the, idea, opening up, is the idea that there will be less reconciliation on the part of the uh, former warring parties, right? And this is particularly important in the context that we described earlier in the debate, uh, in, in my speech, which is about internecine conflict um, between factions of like the, uh, factions within a single state, or like former constituent republics uh, of the Yugoslavian Republic, which, who engage in intermittent war, repeated war, basically. No, thank you, because. Not only are, will, will a, a disproportionate response provoke another disproportionate response, uh, logically speaking, but it also increases the ability of hawks, ethno-nationalists within these countries 
to demand further retaliation with the support of their population now that you've got increased political capital to do so, and that is bad. So contrary to what CG suggests with regard to natural incentives not to engage in disproportionate conflict, the fact that you want to distract your population from domestic issues by engaging in, uh, in international conflict, or the fact that your, your support uh, in, within the public depends on you being a warmongering ethno-nationalist, means that screw diplomatic opinion, screw public opinion, screw state building imperatives after the war is over, your only job is to at attempt to hold that level or that base of support. And if that means creating even more disproportionate responses and killing civilians in the process, that's what these actors are prepared to do. That's not something that we can stand for. No thank you. Furthermore, we think that even if you want to talk about non-state actors like Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah, for example, we think that in the war against terror, it is important to win the war of hearts and minds and not merely neutralize military or, quite, or paramilitary threats, right? So for every civilian that you accidentally kill as a result of a drone strike into like uh, Taliban held like parts of Pakistan or, um, or, parts, uh, or parts of Gaza uh, when we try to take out mass installations, for example, you create a propensity for future terrorists to come attack your state as well. Now, of course, they, they might say, oh no, then states will have a natural incentive not to engage in disproportionate warfare and try to win the hearts, of mind, uh, hearts and minds of these individuals. But we know that's not true always, right? America has had a long history for the last two decades of not getting the war of hearts and minds right, and other states have made such mistakes as well, which is why it's incumbent upon the international community to step in when individual states fail to make this calculus rationally on their own behalf. Yeah, go. When you step into a war, you do that by concluding that you are the most morally superior actor in this interaction. Then why shouldn't then your actions be guided on the principle of taking out your opponent in a manner that it invokes fear and coerces right. that opponent because to meet your demands? Because the fundamental assumption that you're working on is that, is that your war is legitimate from your perspective. But we as the international community who sets international norms don't give a shit about whether you think that your law was legitimate or not. It is about what international norms and what international society you want to create for the rest of the world that ultimately matters. No thank you sir. Oh, sorry, I'll take you in a moment. Yeah, go. Okay, this norm has been on the books in the UN with NATO and a bunch of other international bodies for 60 years. Hamas, the IDF, both sides of the Kashmiri conflict, and literally every interstate actor you I I mentioned, do not abide by the proportional response mechanism. Where is the magic bullet? Ah, uh, I get what you mean. Yeah, right. So in some instances, like, the law of proportionality is, is respected, right? So if you're talking about Britain's response to the uh, Argentine invasion of the Falklands Islands, for example, that was proportionate. Now, like, if you're talking about the Iran-Iraq war, sure, like, there, there were some violations on both sides, but ultimately, it was by a large proportion. Like, the mechanism doesn't work perfectly at all, but you have to envision a scenario in which the removal of such norms is going to make things radically worse, and that is what we've been contending from the get-go. The last thing I want to talk about is on what it actually means for, in, uh, for international society in the long run, right? Because there are two way mechanisms that you need to understand in this debate. The first of which is that even if it is true that deterrence works on their side without escalation or unnecessary escalation, one, it privileges big states over small states. Your POI earlier to opening up was entirely correct in the sense that no one can create a disproportionate response against America, but that is exactly the sort of problem that we are afraid of, that small states are going to be screwed over because they have to fear a disproportionate response by larger parties, and so they, they are constrained with regard to diplomacy or with regard to the use of war as a legitimate tool uh, of international relations. The second thing is that Ultimately, your right to sovereignty and self-defense is not outweighed by the international community's imperative to protect civilians all across the world and enforce their human rights, which means that ultimately the solution, like beyond a proportional response, if a proportional response is not adequate, the solution should not be to resort to a disproportional response but to resort to the international community. For all those reasons, we'll see. Sorry, I'm really sorry, but do you mind if I run to Very quickly. Yeah, 
joke about the HWS tournament running on time, but there is. <laughs> <laughs> not enough app to people get back to that. Sorry. Thank that speaker for earlier remarks. And this House now recognizes the government whip. In this debate, opposition runs a million miles from their birth. This is not a debate about whether carpet bombing Mecca in response to anything that is done in the Middle East would be a good response from the US military. It is about whether preemptive disproportionate action can, in limited cases facing a limited number of groups, be a good idea. Note, in immediate response to the one POI we get in response to this, if it is good for a group, for example in Nigeria, that the US attacks them, I suspect the most sophisticated and largest intelligence operation in the world will probably know of this before they consider an attack and be able to consider the implications of whether bombing a group is likely to be better or worse for the relations that are going to be had in that nation into the future, preempting the only response that comes to our response to their entire case. Three things in this speech, therefore. Firstly, CO's extension, or alternatively, is this debate about IS? Yes. Is it about Kashmir? No. Secondly, how we protect future civilians. Thirdly, the principles of just war, to the extent you want to weigh them in the round. Firstly, on CO. They assert that this debate is really about interstate wars in, say, Southeast Asia, as opposed to the US interacting with non-state actors. I want to point out, like, in overview, that this is something of a tension with OO, who talk exclusively about interstate actions, but given that OO never explicitly said it's only about them, I think that's sufficient. Zeroth response, just at the top, I don't think we have to allow or mandate that this be a response that all militaries be able to use all of the time. That is, to the extent this is a norm that the US does, and the US also regularly breaks other norms that it enforces on other militaries, see the NNPT, I don't think it's a realistically complicated thing for the US to say, we just play by a different rulebook. First, first actual response, though. These conflicts are just less relevant in the 21st century. A, because of mutual assured destruction of nukes that mean, to the extent there are conflicts in Kashmir, they are literally 50 times less violent than they were 15 years ago. B, because of interdependence and economic ties that mean there are strong economic disincentives to creating any kind of conflict that disrupts trade routes. C, because alliances, geopolitics, and the bullying forces of large states that exist on either side of the house mean the incentives for any one nation to engage in these actions are pretty low. Second, Secondly, note that in the status quo, this policy is just not observed by a large number of nations they talk about in the interactions they engage with. So it is true that Kashmiri radicals have often reacted with disproportionately violent force to Pakistani insurgents in the course of the last five years, despite the US telling them not to do it, right? Their only example of where this norm was successfully observed in small state relations was the Falklands. Like, newsflash, we blew up and sank a tanker, guys, for like some tiny island we probably had no particular right to. I realistically do not think this is an example of the norm in action. But thirdly, the only place where a disproportionate response is realistically useful is where there's a massive power imbalance, so that, as, the, as I explained in my POI, you can take them out and then they can't disproportionately immediately take you out, which means the incentive for a small state to do this is zero, and the only realistic place this will happen is when a very large country, read America, tackles a very weak non-state actor, read ISIS. What do they say? They have a principle, which is basically, it is bad for small states to do, so brackets, principle brackets, it would be bad for them to encourage them to do it. Firstly, we already told you why states have their own internal incentives not to do things that are bad for them, and the military has those incentives too. But secondly, the notion this gives disproportionate power to the US is just a fact of the world on either side of the house. This doesn't realistically tip the scales in terms of strength they have. Then they say Hawks will talk about warmongering. Again, this is just a case of which states are going to do this, and we just don't think that the kind of states they're talking about are the situations in which this is likely to happen. I'd also point out that Duterte exists in the status quo, I don't think it could realistically get much worse than that, so I don't think the impact at this point is substantial. Finally, on the international community, OG preemptively responds to this by saying disproportionate responses bring people to the negotiating table faster. I don't think further response is necessary. Let's talk, therefore, about protecting future civilians. Why is this the critical issue in the round, even if we concede civilians now are harmed? Firstly, because the premise on which the principle lies is we all protect innocent people in society. But the fact that innocent people have yet to be like violated by wars that we can prevent doesn't doesn't mean we should care about them any less than civilians who we accidentally kill as a result of conflicts we are ending now. That is, if we can sell far more wars in the future and restrict the harms committed to those people in the future, that's very clearly, magnitudinally, a significantly greater impact to weigh. Secondly, there are more people involved. Actually, I think that's kind of implicit in the first place. But thirdly, the most important burden is to stop nations from backsliding into situations of war in the first place. This also conveniently solves for their argument about negotiations, because if we can prevent deaths 
as the US by encouraging its policy, presumably we look better as an international actor, right. even if we're causing more death in the short run, because people see us as a long-run wise actor. So again, all of this hinges on whether these actions are good or not, and if they are, then we solve the problems they talk about. Why are disproportionate responses therefore good? Firstly, because they take out pseudo-states like IS or the Houthis in Yemen. Because Owo's right, this is the US versus ISIS. That means these bodies have strong domestic power, like basically a functional pseudo-state apparatus, and weak international power, because ISIS can't possibly strike America back, and they certainly couldn't in 2013. Here's the critical thing. At the nascent point where they have taken over elements of the state, but they do not have the level of deep rootedness to defend that territory to the death, a preemptive response can take them out before they grow strong enough to become a real threat that throws the Middle East into a 20-year-long element-like period of crisis. They say this kills civilians. Military leaders will live among civilians, and it didn't take the intellectual brilliance of Archie's LO for them to realize it's a good thing to do, i.e. they do that on either side of the house, I don't think there's a comparative. This leads to escalation, yes, but the comparative escalation will be worse on your side. This hurts rebuilding. I think rebuilding Iraq in 2025, after a decade of ISIS rule, would probably be harder than rebuilding Iraq when the civilians are a little angrier, but the state isn't in rubble after 10 years of the worst force ever ruling them. Yes. So what does it look like to destroy a dispersed terrorist group like Al-Qaeda? It doesn't look an awful lot like 20 years war in the Middle East. Exactly it's, what produced So we ISIS. wouldn't get rid of the dispersed groups, we'd get rid of the state-like actors trying to take over vacuum-like areas by running their own private militias as apparatus of the state, by taking out the oil fields that give them the revenue necessary to exist, and taking out the armories that allow them to arm their people and send trucks through, scaring everyone around. This is why we wouldn't bomb ISIS, Al-Qaeda and would bomb ISIS. It's not a response to our point. Secondly, we massively deter radicalist uprisings because they're a threat of significant force. Critically, we don't need to do this all the time for it to be effective. But thirdly, even if there's the same number of radicals, they no longer kill Americans at the point where their only geopolitical tool leads to immensely devastating consequences for them and for the basis of power they use to control themselves domestically. So if they are a threat, they're only a threat within the region that they exist, rather than they're attempting to create geopolitical storms by killing American civilians and prompting further disproportionate responses. So the kind of visceral, evil, politish, political actions they want come from killing American soldiers, and they're less likely to do that on their side of the house when the deterrent exists than they are on ours. So the future amount of civilians and conflict created is less on our side than theirs. Let's talk about the principles. We get almost no principle defense. All we're told is this is generally bad. But even if that's true, that's a good argument as to why the military wouldn't use it. I'm not going to repeat the half dozen reasons Bobby gives you the military will not regularly use this. But critically, all we have to do now is prove it is plausible that the proportionate standard is sometimes wrong. Four reasons that's the case. Firstly, because it's not just about actions, but probabilities. If ISIS does things that's not actually militarily bad, but increase the probability they might take over a country in the future, that's clearly very bad in expected utility terms. Secondly, the disutility of civilian casualties is immense. Thirdly, Bobby tells you about subjectivity, no response. But fourthly, it compensates for atrocities that we missed because of red lines or because we weren't surveilling. All of these things are plausible justifications that on principle ground are sufficient to beat opposition vents, but frankly, I think we've done enough already. We thank that speaker for those remarks. This House now recognizes the final speaker of the debate, the opposition whip. Here, here. The first thing we need to clarify in this particular debate is what disproportionality in this debate actually means. Because government would have you believe that we are being disproportionate against the same actors that have visited like certain acts of war upon us. That is not true. What they are standing for is disproportionate responses against civilians who have had no part to play in the war whatsoever and have had no decision-making capabilities to be able to actually determine whether or not the first strike was even made or whether or not it was, even it was even proportionate in the first place. Which is to say that on their side, they are literally visiting a harm upon individuals who never consented to this particular war in the first place. That is why the principle coming from opening government doesn't make sense because they would presume that all of these civilians are part of the evil entity that wanted to strike the United States first, but the fact of the matter is that these civilians are oftentimes not part of this particular action, but rather non-state actors purposely built bases near the civilian area so that they are able to gain international sympathy or at least create like some sort of effect against them and to use them as like battering rams or meat shields against further attack. Which is why OG and the entire government literally goes into the hands of what these terrorists or non-state actors even want in the first place by doing this particular and so we don't think that particular principle stands in this debate. The question that we must ask, therefore, given like CG's, I think, very convenient characterization of the debate, is whether or not states can always make the right decision. Because they would have you believe that we will only use this policy in the specific instances where it is 
perfect and would actually wipe out the next IS that would come out. Firstly, I would just like to point out that realistically, that's very unlikely. Like states rarely make these kind of good decisions all the time. But I think I just gave you a few structural reasons why this is unlikely to be the case. Firstly, given that oftentimes these non-state actors, like the motion says, has created some sort of civilian casualty in your nation, recognize that even in nations that, like the United States, that you want to be so happy to say, like, have great intelligence and the like, there are already jingoistic elements that exist within them. They are ethno-nationalists, they are also very war hungry. There are also things like lobbies, for example, that perhaps, like, you know, create guns and benefit largely from, like, the like, proliferation of more war. These are individuals, they are more likely to use the political will on, on, on the other side of the house to try and push their governments towards being disproportionate towards the escalation of that war. So you're right when it comes to like public will and the like, but the public will doesn't go towards negotiations, it goes in the other way towards the escalation of more war for the justice of having, uh, for, for justice for your people. On their side they told us, well, you know, they don't look at life the same way. That's absolutely true. That's because they see the white American life as being 10 or 20 or 1,000 times more important than the brown life from like a nation where the non state actor is being based from. That is why they are happy to fight for a disproportionate response because they think it's only by shedding the lives of thousands of people they are able to justify the killing of a few civilians within your country. That is why we think that it is far more likely that the political pressure towards making the wrong decisions in the vast majority of times is much more likely to happen under the outside of the house rather than not. Which is to say that all of the harm that the opposition bench has been pushing forward so far is more likely to happen than not because you cannot guarantee that the specific decisions that you are making are more likely to be correct than not. Yeah. So all of our analysis shows that military generals have a political and a career incentive not to use um, like too many attacks. But even if they do it too much, doesn't that massively incentivize people um, to avoid civilian casualties in conflict? No, okay, so firstly, um, it is not true to say that they have this incentive to do it. I just gave you some reasons for why they do have incentive to do it. To the extent to which they are venerated as heroes, they are fighting for their cause, we think that's more likely to actually give them like a more positive reason to do this rather than not. So to the extent to which, like, and, and the second thing is sort of premise in the first thing, right? Because you are assuming that, like, because of this, they are less likely to want to have civilian casualties, but that's not the case. Because, like, as an American individual, as an individual from a country that just suffered casualty or civ uh, civilian casualties, you are unlikely to be able to make the distinction between a civilian in the nation that is housing that non-state actor and the actual combatant within in that non in that non-state actor like that party or like IS for example as a whole. You are likely to see all of them as the enemies because that's the way that individuals who are nationalists have just gone through a tragedy looks at the other. That's why you're more likely to be willing to shed that civilian blood and you're not making rational like militaristic or like international relations decisions as a result of this. Politicians are far more likely to do that rather than the like. Why is it this result in terrible like utilitarian outcomes in a way that they want to talk about? I don't told you about the battle of hearts and minds. Recognize that it is not true on the outside. You can simply bomb out like the beginnings of ISIS and somehow that be able to solve the problem of like non-state actors. Recognize that at the end of the day, non-state actors oftentimes act on ideology. I think all talked about this but never really went into detail. The fact of the matter is that you can't really kill ideas simply by like massively bombing them and hoping that they can never come back against it. The first reason why because obviously they often use this insurgency which is to say that like they use small um, they use, they use small uh, uh, small numbers of individuals to be able to create massive like outcomes against your state. Which is to say no thank you. Which is to say that, for example, like things like terrorist bombings or terrorist attacks are all ways in which they're able to create huge amounts of retaliation without necessarily needing wow. the kind of infrastructure or the kind of resources that you guys were talking about in order to create a similar like devastating response against you. The only way that we can win this particular of uh, this particular war is by having sympathy on the ground in the kind of areas that the non-state actors want to operate in, in the first place, and you don't get that at a point in which an entire generation grows up. Think of fearing the sound of American fighter jets and seeing the American emblem and the American insignia as literally something that is tantamount or sim synonymous with the enemy, which is exactly how non-state actors right. uh, sell the idea of the uh, 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 of your disproportionate act actions to the people on the ground. Opening. If the idea of insurgency or rebelling against a particular state actor is so toxic and viral among a particular group, then obviously the only way that you can bring them to the negotiating table is through coercion, which you can then exert through a disproportionate response that strikes fear in their eyes. No, but, but the assumption here is that at the, in the response of this, they are willing to act 
uh, rationally, which we told you that they are not. But the second thing is that you assume that these people will be willing to come to the negotiating table because they care about the number of lives that are lost. Given that I just told you that there is a differentiation between the non-state actors and the people within those non-state actors as well as the civilians on the ground, you presume that the non-state actors actually care about what happens to the civilians when the fact of the matter is that it only harms the nation that is doing a disproportionate response and doesn't actually harm the non-state actor they are trying to fight against. So that means that they are willing to take those costs because those costs only help them in terms of their image to the people on the ground who are not able to tell the difference and also hurt uh, and, uh, and as a result, it doesn't actually create or uh, emphasize more negotiation on your side of the house. The last thing that we told you about this is that at the end of the day, the debate is about norm setting. So I think I'll give you a couple of responses about this. To the extent to which we recognize that oftentimes disproportionate responses on the part of a particular country means that there's norm setting in our uh, in, in terms of like the way all other states or all other non-actors do this particular act, the, re the problem on the other side of the house is that they don't ever deal with the idea that um, they don't ever deal with the idea that sometimes even though not everyone follows these specific norms, it oftentimes does act as a calculus in terms of the way that nations react to the extent to which it might be slightly disproportionate but not as disproportionate as it otherwise would have been. The removal of these norms absolutely only creates the kind of escalation of warfare and the worst of outcomes that we told you about were very happy to